Hello to all and thank you for joining us this evening for the first event in our exciting speaker series, Take Three, IU Bavarian Talks, co-hosted through a collaborative effort between Indiana University and the Bavarian American Academy. In this virtual speaker series, we are delighted to bring together leading scholars from Indiana University and Bavarian institutions to discuss many of the major themes defining this current area in our transatlantic world and beyond. My name is Eric Lehmann and I'm a board member of the Bavarian American Academy, in addition to holding the chair of management and organization at the University of Augsburg in Western Bavaria. It's a pleasure for me to open the speaker series not only as a Bavarian academic and board member of the BAA, but also as a Hoosier, having completed a research stay at Indiana University in Bloomington prior to becoming a full professor here in Germany and an adjunct professor at Indiana University. As we all know, events and initiatives like this speaker series do not just happen. They require dedication, careful collaboration and flexibility through partnership and key people within those partnerships. In this vein, I would like to explicitly thank Dr. Margarita Schweiger-Wilhelm, Managing Director of the Bavarian American Academy, and Andrea Adam Moore, Director of the IU Europe Gateway in Berlin, who, along with the wonderful staff, have put in so much effort to make tonight and the speaker series as a whole a reality. And now it's also my honor to introduce Professor Hannah Buxbaum, Indiana University's Vice President for International Affairs. And prior to this role, she had a number of administrative positions at the university, including as Interim Dean and Executive Associate Dean of the Morris School of Law. She also served as the inaugural academic director of the IU Europe Gateway in Berlin, where I personally had the chance to meet her on the occasion of the opening celebration a couple of years ago. Vice President Buxbaum promotes global engagement at IU across all aspects of the university's mission. She provides strategic leadership in advancing IU's international presence and works collaboratively with administrators, faculty, and staff to expand international research and educational opportunities. She oversees the offices that manage international functions and initiatives of the university, as well as the university's global gateway network. Vice President Buxbaum has a wealth of international experience, which evidences a long-standing commitment to international research and education. Following the completion of her undergraduate and law degrees at Cornell University, she earned a master's degree from the University of Heidelberg. And over the course of her teaching career, she has held visiting appointments at a number of foreign universities, including Humboldt University, the University of Cologne, Université Paris II, Pantheon Assa. She's active in a number of national and international organizations. She has been elected to the curatorium of the Hague Academy of International Law and to membership in the American Law Institute and is member, membre titulaire of the International Academy of Comparative Law. In 2016, she joined the advisory board of the Max Planck Institute for Cooperative and International Private Law in Hamburg. Hannah, thank you so much for joining us tonight. The floor is yours. Eric, thank you very much. Thank you very much for that um, kind introduction. And I am very happy to join everyone this evening or this afternoon uh, as it is here in Bloomington for the first session of this Take Three speaker series. And I really would like to underscore everything Eric said about this, about this collaboration. Um, as he mentioned, Indiana University has a global gateway office in Berlin. And when we opened that office in 2015, 
Our goal was in part to support and strengthen existing research collaborations between our scholars and their counterparts in Germany, including the, the very strong um, collaboration between Eric Lehmann and our colleague David Audrech here at IU. And we also wish to support and strengthen our existing institutional partnerships, um, for instance, the partnership between IU and Freie Universität Berlin. But of course, another priority was to foster new relationships and new connections that would help advance the work of our faculty and students in uh, areas of shared interest. And this collaboration between IU and the Bavarian American Academy is a fantastic illustration of the kind of dialogue that we were hoping to engender with additional activity in, in Germany. So I'm very grateful to, to the leadership of the Academy, um, to my colleague, Andrea Adamur, and, uh, and other staff members at the, at the Global Gateway Office in um, putting this terrific speaker series together. I'm very much looking forward to today's installment on anger, empathy, and pathos, and to the future sessions as well. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Hannah, for your kind words and thoughtful remarks. Now, I also have the pleasure of introducing tonight's speakers who will present the first discussion of our series, Take One, Anger, Empathy and Pathos, The Making of Collective Feelings. First, I would like to introduce my colleague and friend, Professor Dr. Heike Paul. Heike is director of the Bavarian American Academy and chair of American studies at the Friedrich Alexander University of Erlangen, Nuremberg. Having earned her master's degree at Goethe University of Frankfurt, she went on to complete her PhD and postdoc in American studies at Leipzig University. Her research covers multiple topics within American studies, including global sentimentality, American myth, feminist and gender studies, cultural mobility and tacit knowledge. Additionally, she's partaking in large-scale research projects such as the Global Sentimentality Project and Re-Education Revisited Transnational and Comparative Cultural Perspectives of the Post-War Period in the USA, Japan and Germany. Her most published works include an article in American Studies titled Common Grounds American Democracy After Trump, and her book, Amerikanische Staatsbürger Sentimentalismus zur Lage der politischen Kultur der USA, or American Civic Sentimentalism on the State of US Political Culture. And Heike Paul is awarded with the Leibniz Prize, one of the most important prizes for academics here in Germany. Next, I would also like to introduce Professor Dr. Fritz Breitauk. Provost Professor and Chair of German Studies at Indiana University. A great pleasure to see you personally, Fritz, even via Zoom. I think we met the first time at IU about 20 years ago, a great barbecue organized by the German department. Professor Breithaupt has also served as the Director of the Experimental Humanities Lab since 2011. After completing studies program at the University of Hamburg and the Free University of Berlin, he made the move to the United States where he finished his master and PhD in German literature at Johns Hopkins University. His expansive research covers German literature and thought, cognitive approaches to literature, empathy, the narrative mind and experimental humanities among others. His major publications include the books Die Dunklen Seiten der Empathie or The Dark Sides of Empathy, Kultur der Ausrede, eine Narrationstheorie or Culture of Excuse, a Theory of Narrative, and Kultur der Empathie or Cultures of Empathy. As you can see, we have the perfect speakers for tonight's topic. Heike and Fritz, the floor is yours. I think questions are always welcome. Please send them in. And Heike, I hope I'm happy that you will organize it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Eric Lehmann, for these kind words of introduction. And uh, Fritz Breithaupt and uh, myself, we are very happy 
to be the opening act of the Take Three initiative and, and series. And uh, we are also happy to be able now to talk for about an hour or so about topics that are very important to both of us and are very much central to the work that we've done. And hopefully sometime along the way of our conversation, you will join in and you will ask questions, uh, write them uh, to us, send them to the chat. And we're very happy to include you in our conversation. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Um, so thank you, Eric, very kind words. Thank you, Hannah, it's wonderful to see all of you here. Um, and um, thank you to the Bavarian Academy and everyone who's working here to make this possible. But now let's jump into things here. So, so Eric just mentioned your latest publication, Heike. Um, and I think that is a wonderful start for us to begin this discussion. Um, the German title is Amerikanische Staatsbürger, zum amerikanischen Staatsbürger Sentimentalismus, um, which I, I guess we render in English, and Eric did that already, as civil sentimentalism, American civil sentimentalism. So I would invite you to explain to us what you mean by this, um, and also how, you, how did you get to this topic? I mean, what was the urgency for you to, to make a book out of this? I think the urgency that we that we all felt over the last years or so was to address what was going on in the United States. And I don't even want to mention his name, uh, but I think that is sort of the urgency behind that one specific uh, book that you've mentioned. Um, and I think in, in a longer perspective, uh, I would probably contextualize this a bit um, because it seems to me that um, my interest in Uh, the topic of sentimentalism or civic sentimentalism actually began with uh, one book in particular, a book that has become more and more controversial, um, but that has been also quite successful and has had a global reach like rarely any other book. And that book is Uncle Tom's Cabin. So at the beginning uh, of my work on sentimentality, I worked on the archive of sentimental literature uh, in the 19th century, um, also sort of the foundational phase of uh, uh, America, if you will, of the United States. And it was interesting to me how literature played a role in, if you will, world making, um, creating a national symbolic of sorts. Um, and seeing that these literary texts, and of course Stowe's novel is only one example, were always literary texts and there were more than that. There were also texts that uh, did um, uh, politically engage <laughs> with what they saw and what they uh, found in America. So this was uh, one angle from which my interest actually came. And then in a, in a second um, step after I have really done a lot of work on Uncle Tom's Cabin, specifically tracing it from Cincinnati, Ohio, all the way to a beer garden in Berlin. Uh, and there's a, a lot to be said about the really interesting politics of that sort of cultural mobility of that one text. <laughs> I also realized that the, um, the kind of typical sentimental props and, and, and features of that text and many others like it uh, also went beyond um, sort of uh, this, the literary discourse or even the cultural discourse. And they also um, popped up, I think, um, in the realm of political culture. And so this is to me something that I uh, find very interesting as an Americanist looking at the US from Germany, the ways in which Uh, these sentimental um, characteristics are so ingrained in a political culture. We find captivity narratives, <laughs> we find um, narratives of seduction, we find uh, mar narratives of suffering, of heroism. They could be straight out of a sentimental novel. <laughs> And we do find that uh, a lot of times in American popular culture, in self-representations of politicians and so forth. And I know, of course, certainly uh, I'm not the only one uh, to make this observation. As you can see, I put a little archive behind me for tonight to also contextualize uh, my own work a bit in this larger archive of feminist and cultural studies. Um, Lauren Berlin famously said the US is a sentimental nation. And so uh, many others have built those bridges and I, I've tried to um, 
um, yeah, extend the work that I found in the field to cover specifically also the last four years where this kind of civic sentimentalism seemed to have a new dimension or a new role to play in American political life, if you will. So that is the angle that I find with um, the sentimental and its larger ramifications. But of course, <laughs> one of the um, um, one of the texts that I've been engaging with throughout my own work is your work uh, on, on empathy. And it's not just one text, it's actually two books that I should uh, mention here. And I, I want to also draw you out a bit. I mean, you have written two books on, on empathy, one in 2009 and one in 2014. And when you look at them in comparison and in within the larger trajectory, to me, it seems that the the first book is a is a more general evaluation or appraisal of, of cultures of empathy. And then the second one seems to go down one specific path that seems to make it a bit of a, a grimmer thing. So <laughs> I know many reviewers have uh, asked you that or have, have reckoned with your your dark, the dark side of empathy in your work. And I want to hand it back over to you to tell us a little bit about uh, the dark side of empathy and how you would frame that within your own work, why you study affect and emotion. Thank you. Thank you. And we'll come back to what you told us about your own work here. Just want to highlight from your own presentation here, the interesting balance that you see in the continuity of sentimentalism. So you are, even though you see some novelty in the last four years in America or five years now, um, you also stress the, the continuity. And that will, I think, be important for our discussion here to talk about large trends of public moods and so on. So that, so you really, you have a, um, you paint a picture of 100 years here and plus. Okay, empathy. Um, so when I started to work on empathy, um, the assumption was, and that was what I was picking up on in the literature, that empathy is a rather intimate relationship between two people. It's something like you empathize with one other person. That was kind of the model of that. And I thought there is something missing here, which is exactly this collective dimension we are talking about, the take three. <laughs> to advertise our series here. Um, so my starting point, and I'll use that as a segue into the discussion, was to say, well, yes, we can empathize, but the question is, when do we actually engage our empathic abilities? When do we actually get active? And one of the, one of the strongest stimulators for us to get engaged, one of the triggers, as I call it, of empathy, are often observations of conflicts. We see two other parties or two people who are in disagreement or um, might be in open war and a conflict. And that's the moment when we often kind of get engaged. We take a side. Once we take a side, we see things from that perspective, feel then suddenly that the other side is the adversary, the adversary is, is not as good. And then we start to have feelings that match our side taking and suddenly confirm that very often, very initial and very quick and um, impulsive side taking, um, which then leads to polarization. So I basically wanted to explore the political dimensions of empathy, where everyone in the world always used to say empathy is so good because it's good for conflict resolution. Mm -hmm. If you would only have more empathy, um, everything would be better. And I'm not against empathy, to be very clear about it. I think empathy is a wonderful um, gift. It makes us human. We are um, as human beings perfectly wired for empathy, we are the being with empathy and most likely even uh, evolutionary the being with empathy in the sense that our brain developed to have empathy. So I'm not against empathy. However, in the political context, I believe that empathy does, I cannot say more, but often does a lot of damage because it drives polarization. It uh, leads us to take one side and then some uh, often quickly, and then we get uh, wrapped up in that one side and, st and, 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 and we stay um, within that perspective and demonize the other side. So mm -hmm. my starting point to talk about empathy was exactly that collective dimension. There's a second side to empathy and I'll only mention that briefly now here, which is the narrative dimension. Um, Heike and both have a strong and I both have a strong interest in storytelling and the political dimensions of storytelling and the way how we relate to the world by means of storytelling and absorbing stories by others. 
I mean, it's by means of stories that we co-experience the, the, the world of others. It's an amazing ability. And that plays a huge role in empathy too. It's not just that we see someone and then immediately kind of know what's going on, that no, we, we tell ourselves tiny little stories in our mind about the fate of others. Um, we know what is happening in Uncle Tom's um, cabin. Um, we um, can spin um, that we see a little scene and we immediately know what's coming or what was there before. So in that sense, empathy for me was a wonderful way to talk about collective dimensions that seem to be only concerned to people, but in reality have to do with collectives. But it also has this dimension that we are more likely to empathize if we know what's happening and what has happened, why people are in a certain situation. So that was kind of my starting point into it. And I think that's the two perspectives here of um, this um, sentimentalism and the civic civil dimensions of that and the empathetic engagements um, give us a good platform to talk about the phenomena that we observe in the public right now that we face. So let me um, follow up here now and ask you a general question here on that level, um, which is to say, um, wh what is the role that sentiments um, and sentimentalisms and moods play for the public? I mean, why are they important? Is this just something, aren't they just things that go up, up and down and then they disappear? So why should we pay attention to them on a large scale? Yes, I think that we um, would probably agree that it is worthwhile analyzing the way in which we encounter sentiments, emotions or effective responses in, uh, in public life for at least two reasons. <laughs> I think one, um, we would agree that probably we have to pay specific attention to the way in which feelings and effective responses become um, orchestrated, instrumentalized, channeled um, in a specific uh, political discourses. Uh, and of course, this can be very different emotions. <laughs> and we know that we would probably give also uh, examples for the different kinds of emotions that also give title to our uh, talk tonight. So we can talk about anger, we can talk about empathy, we can talk about many other um, manifestations of uh, public feeling. And I think we need to be aware of these kinds of orchestrations of the, the making of public feelings for certain also political aims or goals. This might be very simplistically put, <laughs> but I think that is one very important aspect that we have as literary scholars, as cultural scholars, to look at, as you say, the narratives, uh, look at also maybe the soft power of, of, of narratives and, and dissect them. Um, and on the other hand, uh, certainly, um, as you drew uh, attention to also the empowerment through narratives, I think we can also see how specific groups can actually um, find a voice or can find a role to play in public life via narratives of uh, of suffering. Um, I can maybe briefly refer here to Rebecca Wonzo's book, uh, where she says, you know, specifically in the US, perhaps there is a, uh, a dominant script of how suffering gets you to be recognized as a citizen. Um, and so she observes that with regard to the civil rights movement, for instance. And I think that would be also an example that we could, um, we could see as a, as a, as a crucial one. Um, what I think also uh, maybe connects what you said to uh, uh, my answer to your question is that I think we both have a sense of the deep ambiguity of uh, the complex that we are looking at. Um, and I don't want to make it seem too schematically as either good or bad or normative or non-normative or whatever. I think that we can see in all the phenomena that we study, this ambiguity of what happens when a certain, um, certain structures of feelings are enlisted for a particular cause. So this kind of strategic sentimentality, I think is also what uh, I find matters a lot for our um, civic life. So, and um, yeah, 
I would like to <laughs> hand it over to you and maybe you can uh, also see, uh, tell us like how from your perspective, these topics uh, matter in, in your work. Um, well, I mean, first of all, I think we are in, in full agreement here about the importance of moods but also the ambiguity that you stress here, including of course the potential that is there for, for uh, marginalized groups to be heard, um, to claim some of that. Of course, suffering is an ambiguous kind of um, sword here, being, it can backfire because if you're recognized as the one who suffers, you may also be pinned down in that role as to being the one who gets pitied and all of these kind of things where ultimately people may not truly empathize with your case, but they may more like identify with a helper role that they should be the powerful people who help the sufferers. But the, the interesting thing and um, here for me, and I think again, we are fairly close in that respect is that um, we have seen a new dimension here of suffering um, where the sufferers also can reclaim agency I mean, where they are, can be the ones who, who don't just want to be pitied, but actually can be heard and do something and don't want others to act in, on their behalf. Very interesting, very interesting. Um, let me add in one additional feature from my own research uh, these days, um, which is actually that I uh, found that my new playground again, I'm playing again, I play telephone games. Um, and I play telephone games, this, this, this children's game, or one person tells a story to someone else who then passes on whatever he or she understood to the next person and they will tell it on to the next person and we get chains of these kind of things. In my lab, we do this with thousands, 10,000s of people in some cases to see what is it ultimately that sticks in it in stories. I mean, what are the things that people remember? And the old paradigm was that it is causality. I mean, why someone is doing what to whom, that that is what's sticking. But that's not what we are finding. We are finding in many, many cases now that it's kind of the emotional appraisals, the ending emotions that stick. Um, they are more powerful as that what remem people remember and what they hear in others than the facts. And people may change the facts completely, but it will be similarly happy or similarly embarrassing, whatever they hear. But what was embarrassing or what was happy or sad may have changed. So that adds to this general urgency of considering moods, moods and emotions that get be heard or empathetically perceived from others too, they stick. What was behind it and so on, maybe a different thing, but uh, I, I agree that moods are very, very important here, emotional values. Uh, most people only do what is within the space of their mood or what others are doing, what they think others are doing, that's what they do. So that's the space of action. Let me. Um, throw this back to you here um, to kind of look at an example here of this. Um, and I was thinking in, in your case here of mourning as a public feeling. Um, there's a lot of occasions um, that we have had on both sides of the Atlantic to mourn. We had 20 years of 9-11, um, but we had other, many other things um, that have been displayed as an activity of mourning. How could you explain to us your approach to looking at mourning as a public feeling? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I would consider mourning uh, a public feeling next to other discourses that we've seen um, elaborated uh, happiness or you know, anger or, you know. Uh, so mourning is a, a specific um, also cultural practice that, um, um, is manifested, uh, well, man grief manifests uh, in mourning. And I think public rituals of mourning have been very pervasive just recently and not only uh, in the US, <laughs> uh, certainly that we've had uh, um, a new president come in who ran his campaign on, on as a mourner in chief or the designated mourner, I think that has, uh, become quite a cliche by now, but uh, to some extent, uh, it probably was successful uh, to use this uh, title or this framework uh, to show that he has empathy and that he is willing to listen, that he's willing also to take on 
uh, the uh, burden of mourning of the nation or of his um, fellow Americans, to put it a little um, uh, simply here. So I think that uh, uh, Joe Biden certainly personifies this 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 new um, discourse of mourning. Um, and beyond that, uh, certainly we have to acknowledge that we are in a pandemic. Um, and I think we can see, again, cultural specific patterns where mourning as a public feeling is um, uh, articulated. And uh, I want to just briefly also refer again to the sentimental registers or the repertoires that I indicated earlier. I think when we look at the the protests right now, and not even protests, but civil societal um, forms of engagement to um, also get people to become inoculated, for instance. <laughs> uh, I think there has been a new discourse about the orphans. And the orphan, of course, is a figure from sentimental literature of the 19th century. Uh, Susan Warner, Charles Dickens, Huck Finn, uh, you know, <laughs> train, I guess. <laughs> uh, and now we can see a new discourse in the United States, at least, around those orphans, 150,000 children and babies whose parents died from, from COVID. And, and that is, um, um, I think this is sort of um, evoked as a message to uh, those out there to help end the pandemic um, through different strategies or scenarios. Um, and I think here mourning the parents or mourning the, the children left behind, I think is a powerful device. And I would consider this also um, a case study of, of civil sentimentality. Um, I've, I've heard this uh, here um, in Germany <laughs> on the news quite a bit lately uh, that people, doctors, uh, um, have uh, asked, you know, why we, why don't we do that more? Why don't we engage more in sort of the this effective um, senses uh, of of people? And there was a, a short little clip here that we that we had from our I think Ministry of Health that did something a little like that uh, in a different in a different spirit. But uh, yeah, I think it is. Um, also culture specific, the way public feeling, the public feeling of mourning gets shown and gets disseminated and shared. Yeah. So uh, that maybe just as a case study, um, I want to come back to what you said about your lab <laughs> and about the, the way that you um, tell us or show us this rift or this detachment that you observe between mood and feeling on the one hand, and narrative precision, or whatever we want to call it. <laughs> and I know that you have also done some sort of conceptual work around these uh, kinds of observations. And one of uh, the keywords uh, in your research um, has been cognitive, cognitive distortions, I believe. Um, to me, this idea of cognitive distortions echoes also affective dissonance or you know other terms that uh, I've encountered um, in the past but I want to ask you about you know what do you talk about when you talk about cognitive distortions and how does that play into questions of feeling and mood thank you thank you um, so on a large scale I think the the figure of the orphan and the public mourning you describe is probably one of the key marks and staples of our age. There's a second one that I, this gives me an opportunity to bring in a second one, which is polarization. Um, and I will talk about this. And already to get everyone, all our, um, our audience engaged here, the question is, well, both of them don't sound super positive. Um, mourning and the, considering the orphan, um, and polarization are definitely not positive. The question is, where's the positive? But let me come to polarization and the question of cognitive distortions. So this is, a, and I'll explain this briefly here, um, how we got to this. We did a study in which we tracked the change of cognitive distortions over time in the last 120 years. Now a cognitive distortion is a thinking and speaking pattern that has been first recorded in the studies of people with depressions, but it also is associated with other disorders. Um, these are ways how people uh, make sense of the world. They're normal speaking patterns, but they you find them more often than people who have who might have a clinical depression or who might be affected in other ways. Um, one of those is kind of like the polarization, like everything is 
either this way or that way, nothing in the middle, or everything's going to the extremes, like the worst or the best. Again, very extreme. Another one is labeling. Instead of saying, oh, um, someone has a certain condition, they get labeled as saying, oh, he is a homeless or I am a, um, labeling an entire identity under one noun. Those are patterns, there are 12 of those that we tracked over time um, in, um, in, in the published book sources that are available. And the horrible thing we found was that, first of all, this method seems to be uh, being quite appropriate. I mean, in, in the German public, we looked at Spanish, English, and German. Um, in the German record, we can see all the historical um, crises, I mean, World War One, World War Two, especially, the highest that had ever been in any language, the big recessions of 1929, 1923, the building of wall, you always see the spikes, people react right away. And then we see a very um, alarming pattern, which starts in 1980. 1980, cognitive distortions were the low point collectively in all language zones. But then since then, it has been going up and up, reaching and passing the area of the German National Socialist um, record. Suddenly, something is strange. And that includes polarization. And that seems to be something, a kind of form of warped thinking that's taking over. Um, it doesn't mean that people actually are clinical depressed individually, but that there's a collective mood that stifles people. Um, at least there seems to be some evidence for that. So we are right now looking for how powerful is that. For the topic of polarization, I would say, in, which is one aspect of these cognitive distortions, I mean, this division, I would say that next to mourning is probably one of the staples of our time, politically, um, and on, on many levels of being with people. It has become harder, in, it seems, for us to, to talk to people who are different from us, to even engage those kind of people. Um, we fall apparently into patterns where we are much more divided. Um, this has been fairly obvious here on the, Atl uh, on the American side of the Atlantic, but there's indication that something like this might be happening in Europe too. Um, in, Germany, um, um, there's trends in that too. I always kind of see Germany as a country where there's still more of that happening. Um, for me, it's always still the happy encounters and trains where you can talk to people who are different from you, only that we can't travel by trains as safely any longer since COVID. So there's a lot of problems here. So, um, okay, so, so let me use this kind of a somewhat grim picture that the two of us have painted here to ask you again, um, I mean, you can choose which angle you want to take. Um, how moods change over time? I mean, what is the long impact here? Um, is there hope for us or is this all gloom? And maybe also then thinking about it is, where do you see positive lights in this? Is there something that stands out against these rather sad um, trends that we observe here? Is there something else? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> um, I think there is hope. Yes, um, let's. Um, uh, I want to backtrack a little. Certainly, I don't want to make any um, strong empirical claims with my work. I cannot do that, right? Because being a literary scholar working in in the field uh, with cultural representations, um, I'm. I'm not really uh, in the position uh, to construct causality, you know, from this to that. So I want to make this a little looser, or maybe a little more, um, uh, yeah, looser, a little less conclusive. <laughs> um, I think we can see um, different tendencies at different times, and I don't think that the discourse of public feeling is all that monolithic. Um, given that we can look at specific groups, we can look at specific actors, um, or we can look at uh, specific constellations. Yeah. So um, when we look at, um, for instance, um, civil society groups who are um, engaging in certain kinds of, uh, of protest, then the, the perspective is a completely different one than when you look at presidential rhetoric, for instance. <laughs> um, and so I, I do think that there is you know, room to maneuver and there's whole room to uh, look at uh, very different 
kinds of text and representations. And depending on what you zoom in on, um, there is a um, more or less optimistic, hopeful or hopeless uh, outlook. What, one thing that I was trying to, um, I'm, I'm still working on that, so that's not a concluded <laughs> project yet, but um, I'm actually trying to um, step back a bit from this notion of cultural specificity and just also try to engage sort of more global references. And, and one thing that uh, I was um, I was seeing uh, in a sort of um, images, narratives, uh, material that we can see around the founding of the United Nations. Uh, and I'm thinking about the family of man expedition, uh, exhibition, expedition also. It was an expedition because it <laughs> traveled the world, but of course it was an exhibition <laughs> and how a certain aesthetic aims to construct sort of a, um, a larger a framework for people to be um, sharing rather than being antagonistic. Um, and uh, I think right now I'm trying to identify certain moments. Um, one of my colleagues, uh, Gerd Hurm in, at the University of Trier has done extensive work on the Family of Man exhibition and I probably don't have a lot to add to that, but taking it as a symptom for a discourse of what I would call global sentimentality and look at it uh, in that light and, and just focus on the way that the kind of a world public sphere is created and how can that maybe be um, create an impetus for overcoming polarization here and there. But I think that's very much in my work limited to specific narratives, to specific visual cultures. And I always have to go circle back to the literary texts <laughs> uh, that I look at. And that uh, is of course a very special discourse, a very special source. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What about you? <laughs> um, hope. Um, I think your microphone is turned off. Oh, yeah, no, oh, yeah. yeah, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> I, I wanted to save you from my, my giggles and laughs here. No. No, I, I, and and um, I agree. I mean, it's and I liked here. Here's one of the keywords you gave us at the, the end is interesting the one of the literary critic, the one who listens and who reads carefully. Um, um, uh, if you read, if you look carefully at what other people do and what they tell us um, on a very small level, every one of us can make a difference. Everyone who listens carefully to others and so on um, breaks out of all these seemingly polarized patterns that often appear that way from, from a very high kind of level and high scale. Um, so, so I am um, probably by more or less by nature kind of an optimist and, and, and I, my, my question here about seeing, okay, we are stressing the negative is here to say, well, there is actually a lot of positive that is happening and has been happening. Um, both of us are uh, trained humanists and in the humanities, there's a huge trend and also in the social sciences to focus on the negative, of course. Um, that's how you get attention. That's what we were trained to see, but that's critical theory or also even on the affect theory side, people tend to look at that. But if you look at global developments, of course, um, the world has come closer together. The United Nations um, are not just kind of like a mere fantasy. Um, it's not that we have a world government at this point. It's not that we have come overcome division, but, but we've made enormous progress in the fighting of global hunger and so on. I mean, so there is something, the idea of the globe, the world family, and I like that you stress that the we feeling is somewhere there. Mm -hmm. um, climate change is another one of those huge topics where most people right now may kind of say, we're not doing enough. That is probably correct. Uh, many people are slow about it, but it's also wrong to say we're not doing anything. There is cooperation coming on on many sides so in that sense i do think there is something um from the positive sides so so one of the aspects was of course the question about how do things change over time and some things are big ships they change slowly but there's there also there's a lot of changes that happen rapidly i mean something new idea jumps up in politics we are often seeing kind of new ideas pop up um, new forms of radical things in germany it was the alternative for germany as a new party that just came up um, very um, fast 
Um, here at Indiana University, we could observe it. Here I should mention the anecdote that Bernd Lucke, the economist who was one of the two co-founders, spent a sabbatical year here and then came back with his ideas. So, so we observed it and suddenly there was a wildfire of that new idea. But we also saw um, Black Lives Matters and the Me Too movement um, pop up where new movements get a voice um, and there's new agency given to players who were left out. And so ultimately I would put my pin my hope on, um, um, on this very idea that you mentioned early on, Heike, mean, meaning this idea that suddenly people um, who feel like they've been left out, who suffer, can claim a voice nowadays. We hear more voices. And that in the beginning, this is stressing the negative and the divisive aspects and the morning side seems to be normal. But I have the hope that we're moving towards a more inclusive democracy in the long run. And there's still much work to do. I mean, there's the huge division between rich and poor countries that I think we have not even really scratched on. There's something, there's real work for us as a planet to do. Um, but more of these voices are now there. Mm -hmm. And we, we could even look at these uh, movements uh, in more detail. And also, I mean, for me, it is, of course, interesting how uh, the Me Too movement, for instance, which yes. is um, extremely important and has extremely, you know, uh, impact, has it had a huge impact on uh, various discourses, public discourses. Um, uh, but how this movement, is, as an example, <laughs> um, does become... Um, intelligible in its articulation of protest, again, mm -hmm. by referring to certain sentimental tropes, right? So the, the evil seducer and the damsel in distress. And uh, feminists have also pointed to, uh, again, the ambiguity of these framings. You know, of course, I'm thinking about uh, the Weinstein case and there are similar, similar ones like that, but that of course was the, the big case that we all heard and all followed. And so, um, you know, feminists have, have been critical about the way that Me Too can, in part, really focus on these very dramatic stories uh, where glamour becomes uh, uh, is, is subverted or is um, deconstructed <laughs> in that case, and, and the women again as uh, uh, the victims. Uh, so, and what does that say about um, feminist agency? And, and should not me too focus more on sort of structural inequalities, on uh, structural problems, uh, on sort of notions of equal pay uh, and so forth, rather than on always very personalized uh, settings and scenarios that do get a lot of public attention, right? <laughs> more so than those other things that may be structurally much more important and uh, much more resounding and much more relevant for for women in the workplace or women uh, in families and so forth. But it is this scenario that uh, the Me Too moment began with, right? It, of course, it has changed now, but this is the, the, the primal scene that we all think of. You know, we think of this uh, dirty old man uh, with the bathrobe and we think about uh, the beautiful actress in the hotel room. Um, and that I think that is a very sentimental scenario in, in many ways <laughs> and uh, so I think all of these I, I don't know if we want to talk about other movements as well but we can see how these movements in trying to get uh, a certain kind of or uh, garner a certain kind of momentum of course on the one hand they use uh, well-known well-rehearsed storylines and plots while trying to add to that or try to uh, appropriate those plots or, or try to use them to address a new issue, a new problem. So I think that is very interesting to see for me. <laughs> hmm. And I, can I, uh, I wanted to come back, sorry, I want to come back to the laboratory again, because <laughs> I was very intrigued by what you said. And as I said, to me, it kind of exceeds my own expertise in what I'm doing. Um, and I wondered, I wanted to ask you about your, and this would be maybe on a different level, uh, because we are also, um, this is announced as a scholarly conversation. So let me uh, uh, ask you about your, your sense of how interdisciplinarity works. 
when doing effect studies or when looking at emotions, because I think we've all been referencing people in sociology, in, in, in other fields uh, of study, political science, uh, and, and your, your connection now would be to do uh, of cognitive studies, cognitive science. Um, so what do, you, what do you see is this interdisciplinarity um, helping you understand or maybe also where are the limits of that interdisciplinarity? Because you, you said that earlier, we are both coming mm -hmm. from the field of German, respectively American literature <laughs> after all. <laughs> so yeah, I, I wonder uh, what, what you would uh, say about that. Yeah, I mean, so, so let me move this question. Thank you, thank you. Let me move this question to kind of the academic landscape, how I would describe this. So Isaiah Berlin, um, 50, more than 50 years ago, gave us this beautiful image of two types of researchers, the hedgehog and the fox. Um, and he, he at that point said, well, the hedgehog is the one who kind of covers a small terrain, but he defends, they, she defend that terrain very well. Um, they become experts, they expert on a small kind of area. The fox, on the other hand, um, is someone who covers a much terrain, um, um, who knows a lot about some areas, but is not an not an expert. I mean, if some there's a little change here and there, the foxes may not even notice that. So they 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 bring things together. And 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 as I believe said, basically we need both. We need the real experts, and we need the people who who build bridges, who bring things together. Now the could academic landscape as we have it now, I think strongly favors the hedgehogs um, because the, um, the peer review system is set up that way that basically whenever there's a published work coming out, it will have to face the experts. And that's probably right and it's correct. I mean, you don't want things to be published that don't pa uh, pass the kind of the snuff that the expert test. Um, at the same time, of course, the, the experts are also there defending territory and this is where the whole thing becomes ambivalent they want to they they will they will claim that they know more about this area or in the bad case and but, but anecdotally what you often hear this paper that was just submitted for publication didn't quote all of my papers so therefore i cannot pass it obviously they have no idea um, how important my work is so therefore they get knocked out so the landscape is definitely not in favor of the foxes right now Mm. So, so people like you actually face exactly that. Um, so how, and that was now your question. So how do we, how does one deal with this? How can one bridge kind of divides and so on? Um, and I mean, I think there's, there's two answers. The one is collaboration. So the skills that I don't have, I have to ultimately say, okay, I, I cannot pretend that I know certain things. I can also not ignore it. I have to get it into the team. So in terms of, for example, the statistical work for some of our studies have been done by John Kruschke here at Indiana University. He's the textbook author of Bayesian Statistics for Psychology in America. Um, so, so he is looking at things and he makes our life really difficult, but really wonderful too, because suddenly we see things that we didn't see before and we, we, it slows us down on a large thing. So in a large thing, it's, I think it was, there is a certain kind of trust of others and the expertise of others, collaborations. And then on the other side, for me, it has been really kind of like saying, okay, I have to sit in the classes too. So I, I'm, I'm taking classes again. For example, I took a uh, um, class on statistics again. So we really understand what has happened in statistics since I left the school, which is a little while ago. So, um, so and I, I believe that that is really what we need. But the new skill for, for all of the students who are listening to this is, I would say, is really kind of like try to build up teams of people that are different, try to build up teams from people who are studying at a different university or really focusing on a different field. That is a skill that, that we need to acquire to kind of bring these perspectives together. And then for people to be self-confident to say, well, what we do, let's say in literary criticism, close reading, don't immediately sell out to something that is statistically more shiny or something like that. That's not, we need both things coming together. And that's kind of the, that has been the principle in the lab is basically to say, no, we have people from different fields here. We are trying to collaborate and we try to meet the standards of different fields. So I try to avoid saying that we are doing interdisciplinary work. We, we, I say we work 
in a multidisciplinary field, which means we have to live up to the expectations of more than one field at the same time. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, and that's, so, so, I mean, let me throw this question back to you. <laughs> um, <laughs> you are, uh, you're making, I mean, and that, this is, this is what we all admire about your work, of course, is that you are trained in the rhetorical analysis and close readings of literary texts and literary tropes. Um, and now you see them at work in dimensions that go far beyond the, the one literary text. You see them suddenly in the speeches by politicians and you see them popping up in public work, works. So you see them in newspapers and stuff like that. Um, so what kind of um, checks and balances do you wish for your work? I mean, wh how do you want this to be kind of, I mean, because we, we want critics, good critics who tell us you're right on or you're going too far. Mm -hmm. What are you hoping for here? What is kind of, what is your checks and balances now from the academic side mm -hmm. that you hope to see there? Yes, I, I have uh, critics. <laughs> now, first of all, yes, I, uh, uh, I would um, agree with you that collaboration is very important um, uh, with regard to trying to um, see one's own work from a new perspective <laughs> and also to help others maybe see dimensions of what, whatever there is they're looking at also in a new light. Um, and so I'm very happy that in Erlangen, we have a group of collaborators from different fields, political science, uh, uh, cultural studies, literary studies, media studies, um, um, sociology also. Um, and we all look at the sentimental in, in, in some various manifestations. And it's, it's very helpful because just to give you an example, um, of course, there is a large discourse of, about sentimentality in American studies. Uh, I indicated that earlier, but there are other fields or other regions um, where this discourse does not exist in just the same way. And so I think it's really interesting to even question the semantics of the sentimental when you translate it from English into German, into Chinese, into uh, Arabic. And, and we are sort of doing this right now. And it, it just sort of gives you a very different perspective on the phenomena itself, right? It also deconstructs <laughs> the phenomena uh, to some extent. And so that I find this very fruitful. And so I am very um, much in discussion with, for instance, people in political science. That's, that's very helpful for me, um, yeah. Oh, Fritz, we have questions coming in. Shall I bring them up? I think no. this is a good moment. <laughs> a it's a good here. moment, right? <laughs> yes, exactly. exactly. <laughs> so, um, I think the first question goes to you, Fritz. It's uh, from uh, one viewer who asks, um, he, he wants to sort of revisit this whole idea of empathy driving polarization. Mm -hmm. So, and if still empathy is a good thing, but it does drive polarization, how do we become more moderate? How can we disconnect from polarization um, with or without empathy? Is that a question mm -hmm. you can answer? <laughs> okay. I can say something in response to the question, but I can answer it is that that is for someone else to judge here. Um, so um, first of all, thank you for that question. And the question of moderation, of course, is very central here because of course, we all long for that middle ground and, and, and the possibility that we can listen to the other side and let it stand without kind of jumping to judgments here. And my, my take on this is that actually that that is not some, something where we want to have empathy involved so much here. So in the political cases where um, conflict resolution has succeeded is a strong word, but at least has played a, a, a nuanced role where, where conflicts didn't fully escalate. Um, empathy often was kind of downplayed. Um, so I'm thinking here about um, the end of the apartheid regime in South Africa, um, with the truth and reconciliation process. And they're not saying that pr process was perfect and run in the best possible way. But it wasn't a failure. It wasn't a radical failure. I mean, the, the conflict ended without too much violence. And that was a process. And this is why I'm stressing that, that very deliberately excluded empathy. Um, people had to tell, confess the truth, I mean, truth and reconciliation. They had to say what they did. 
Um, and then in virtually all cases, it was already decreed, as long as they sell everything they did, it would be legally forgiven to them what they did. There would be a life after that confession, after that um, statement at the tribunal. It didn't say, we try to understand you. It didn't try to say, oh, we feel for you, you poor suffer, uh, you poor um, um, perpetrators or torturer. There was nothing of that kind. People said, no, no, we all have our feelings, but the, they are not part of that legal process. So in that sense, I think for conflict resolution, and we have a lot of conflicts, um, empathy might not always be the right kind of thing here. Um, so that is um, where I would start with that process. Mm -hmm. Mm, when there is an acute situation of a conflict, tension, that's one of these things where empathy helps us. We see that constantly in every movie we watch or when someone tells us a story, the situation of a conflict is so clear to us that we get intrigued. Clarity is the biggest driver of empathy, when we know suddenly clearly what someone else is feeling um, or the situation they're in, and conflict is one of those, or competition can also be one of those, um, or suffering is another very clear situation, then we get drawn into it. So, And that that is positive too, we go along to a certain way, but when it comes on larger scales, we have to lean back. So for me, the answer there is to say, as strong and powerful as empathy is, for moderation, we probably may say, okay, let's not go with our feelings too much. Let's try to be different here. Let's not to, to think about empathy first. We need to learn to block empathy in those kind of cases. And that is not a bad thing. Blocking empathy can be very helpful for various reasons, also for our self-protection. There's empathy burnout too in some other situations and so on. Doctors suffer from that. So that's that's what I would say in that in response to that question. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So, so you make a, a case for witnessing rather than feeling empathy in some ways, huh? With being a yes. witness. Yeah. Yes. I mean, staying outside. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I like that. So the um, the second question also revisits uh, an earlier part of our conversation about um, the mourner in chief, Joe Biden, the argument that has worked as a strategy in the US. And so the question would be, how do we translate that uh, to Germany? Could it work? Oh, how are emotions used strategically in the German context or why are they not used in the same way in Germany? Um, and I think that um, my first yeah, my first response would be to say that there are certain kinds of uh, pathos formulas, to use that term, that um, are part of specific um, sort of political spheres and political discourses and for very good reasons uh, within the German political culture, there has been a kind of a um, cathartic moment after uh, uh, World War II to sort of disengage from um, effective responses in specific ways <laughs> and to, to tone down a public show of um, effects and feelings or even just to um, make people think that there could be something that you want to engage with on an emotional or effective level. That is something that is, there's a specific, I think, German uh, responsibility of having a history of um, misuse of effect uh, and uh, of um, moving the masses through effective um, instigation um, that uh, is probably very appropriate. Um, and now I think recently when we look to our leadership, <laughs> I think you have seen discussions about Angela Merkel and uh, her lack of showing feeling or her lack of being demonstratively emotionally engaged. And uh, observers have um, looked at her like now with more uh, interest now that she is <laughs> uh, taking leave you know there are articles all over the place so does she have feelings after all and you know where do we see them and do we see them when she meets uh, Macron and what is it about the her, her statements that she gave during the pandemic and and so there's always this this wish or this desire to identify sort of the the, the feeling human being uh, behind the uh, official persona of the politician um, but I think that um, in, in the case of Merkel, she um, 
made that search very uh, difficult <laughs> and uh, yeah, for, for good reasons, uh, probably. So, yeah, go ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and I think I can follow in what you said here. Um, political leaders are in a very strange position here. Um, that, um, and I would differentiate two levels here. The first one is the acknowledgement of a crisis, an emotional situation. But the second one is the modeling of the feelings that one could have in response to that. And I think we would very quickly agree, probably, I mean, it's, well, that's a question for Heike, that the first aspect of it, the acknowledgement is enormously important. So whether it's Joe Biden as the mourner in chief or um, Angela Merkel at the beginning of the Corona crisis when she had these famous speeches, um, very sober, appealing to the public. Um, she acknowledged the feelings and the, the losses, the mourning. Um, that was um, very powerful and very helpful. Now, as public leaders, as, um, as presidents, chancellors, um, these people also, of course, become um, figures that people I, I, that people identify with. I mean, they model something for others, which means that others start to imitate them, um, and that's probably that cannot be avoided. But that's typically where it's, where it's say it starts to backfire, mm -hmm. um, where it becomes much more divisive on many levels. Um, then suddenly, people feel like, okay, so. Is that really, is that my feeling or I'm just imitating someone else um, where the divisiveness of that um, speaks out or in the case of the refugee crisis, um, my argument would be that many Germans didn't really develop true empathy or full acceptance and pre-appreciations of the, the fates of all these different refugees and their life stories. No, they rather identified the model Angela Merkel, who said, "Hey, come, we 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 can handle. We, I mean, we have an obligation. We can do it. Um, come here." They wanted to be the hero. They wanted to be in the spotlight. They fell for the trap of identifying with a leader, which is easier and comes cheaper, but at the same time, then often backfires. Um, people want to acknowledge for their identification. They want to get respect for that. Um, and that's where the whole thing then backfires, um, where even resentment is yeah. not. Yeah. So in that sense, I would differentiate a little bit on that level also here between the first phase of the acknowledgement of the crisis, but then also in this modeling the response where mm -hmm. that usually becomes very tricky. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I recognize one of your chapters in the dark side of empathy, right? <laughs> Where you talk about this at length. So, you know, this is, there would be a longer argument about this. But uh, I think the same um, uh, argument has been made for uh, sentimental engagement. Uh, the, the classical text by James Baldwin on Uncle Tom's Cabin um, specifically is exactly making that point that it, it is uh, marking sentimentality as a very self-reflexive response that does not really have an object and does not really um, is um, mobilized, but it's uh, you know self-sufficient in engaging in one's own uh, cosmos of emotions uh, rather than reaching out. So I think this is uh, one one argument that you know has been made repeatedly, also about sentimentality. Oh, we have we have more questions. So let's. Um, tackle the next one. <laughs> the next one is uh, asking about uh, social media. Uh, what is our view or your view in uh, uh, social media as creating or increasing public moods? Are modern media and in particular social media, are they responsible mainly for the strong emotions and moods or are they just one of the drivers? This is a question that uh, you can both think about. <laughs> I guess. Certainly, I mean, certainly I would not disagree. Um, I would probably say there is a thin line between uh, thinking of the media as having its own dynamic and as sort of uh, driving um, the discourse on its own and having agents behind this media using the media to to uh, create certain events. But I think in the US, we are still looking at the um, revelations around the January 6th um, 
coup attempt uh, at the capital. And uh, we can see that uh, through all the back channels and through all the organization that has happened um, right up to that day, social media played a huge role. And, and, and surprisingly, uh, many people who should have been in charge of security on that day were not even looking or were not taking those messages at face value or were seeing them only as um, uh, meaningless uh, threats. Yeah? So I do think, yes, of course, uh, this uh, event and many others show us the, the deep impact of social media as uh, that can be used to a certain uh, goal, to a certain end, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, to add to that, um, and maybe this is maybe this is naive, but my large scale opinion here is that to say, well, first of all, who are the social media? In this case, it's mostly us. <laughs> um, yes, they have platform decisions and they play a role, of course, and there's anonymity that suddenly pops up, and there's a lot of critical ethically problematic effects, critical mass effects of minorities, suddenly radical groups. This can be very good, of course, minorities that suddenly can connect, but of course, radicals suddenly feel like there's critical mass and they take off. Yes, there are negative effects from the platform, but to a large degree, this is us. And what is this? This is social communication. People talk about what's important to us. So for me, this the social media still stand in a line of what Robin Dunbar in his work has kind of um, stressed, an evolutionary biologist, um, about the development of the human brain, basically saying that, what did the human species do in comparison to other animals? Well, he claims beautifully in the title of his book, we replaced grooming, which is very time intensive, by gossip. And gossip holds us together, makes us feel good, social chit chat about this and that. And I think on social media, I would say there's a lot of that is happening there too. So I don't want to go too far and demonize social media. First of all, it's mostly us, it's our content. But then there's a lot of connection. There's a lot of positivity in it. Um, and so if you we look at the studies that come out about it, they're not all black or white or so. They show some goods. There's a lot of good things that people have transported, the positive gossip, the chit chat, on the social media. So in that sense, I want to be careful kind of to make a, a huge bold claim that goes too far in the extremes. Although of course I do see the effects like the effect that Heike was describing in for the 6th of January, the capital um, riots and other kind of effects where we see, yes, they play a problematic role in certain things, but they also play a lot of positive roles on the political mobilization of things. So I think, um, so I'm, my, I'm one of the people who would say, well, I, I I don't want to blame the social media as an impulse first. I want to first say what, who's posting, who are we and stuff like that and how do we use the social media? Mm -hmm. um, we have a couple of more questions. <laughs> One refers to something that you mentioned earlier Fritz, about the, maybe the necessity of blocking empathy. So uh, one person uh, is asking, do you think that for specific uh, groups or people, for instance, for physicians, uh, uh, even though empathy is blocked to prevent burnout, the physician can still truly learn from the situation, uh, yeah, even when blocking his, his or her empathy? Yes, I mean, the, 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 this is um, a clear case for me that I would say what we really need to learn is to say when we want to block and when we want to unblock and allow empathy. Um, uh, I, I, even though I've written a book that's called The Dark Sides of Empathy, I'm not propagating to say, oh, we should all block empathy and leave it out and become hyper-rational beings or something like that. No, no, no. What I would say is um, we need to be aware of this possibility. And there are people who get, uh, who, who suffer from having too much empathy, who are like, um, hostages to situations um, towards other powerful people or who want to do too much good. And medical doctors do a lot of good, but the only problem is their work 
day is so hard. They jump from one patient to another. Um, they get don't get the emotional temporal arcs that they see healing and improvement and so on. That is very taxing. And so these people, um, I would say, no, don't want to block it completely, but find ways to manage your empathy. So in that sense, it's about managing these kind of things of allowing and not allowing it. Not you, People do not owe empathy to everyone. So it, this is your empathy to channel and to manage. Um, and, but then if, you, if people are able to manage it and to control it a little bit, I think they are also able to use it, sounds too utilitarian, but to really employ it in very positive ways. Empathy is good for us. For the empathizer, it makes us live longer, be more connected. It's a richer life that we live, and it's good for other people too. I mean, the uh, patients of a doctor who think that their doctor has empathy for them um, are doing better. And at least one thing we know about this is they're more likely to take the medicine as, pres to, as prescribed. About 50% of patients do not take medicine as prescribed um, for various reasons, but that often is very, very bad for them. This is 50% that number apparently is even true for cancer and cancer medicine. Um, and this trend can be changed when the patients feel that their doctor has empathy for them, feels for them, they're more likely to take medication. So they, we know there's positive effects. I mean, there's probably others too, obviously. So we need to find balances. People need to individually manage it. I have gotten a lot of um, correspondence from people who read my, my, one of my books or so to say, how can you teach me to, to block empathy? I'm suffering from this. And that is true. They, that, is, that is difficult. And I, actually, unfortunately, I don't have a very good answer to people there, except to say, observe when it happens. What lures you in? Why can you not, in certain cases where you know that you will be exploited, you're thinking also about what Heike was saying of the, the manipulations on the mass scale, um, on the political sense where moods can be used to exploit you. How, when does it happen? And maybe you can see the signs early and try to say, okay, let's, let's withdraw. Mm -hmm. So maybe one last question that we have here, we can take that as our final question perhaps, and then um, uh, wrap it up. Um, so the question um, relates to the fact that we have been looking at the United States and Germany a bit, mostly maybe the US or maybe in the transatlantic framework as um, befits our series. <laughs> uh, but uh, so the question is that when we not talk about the United States and Germany, uh, what is different in places and countries that are not or do not appear to be as polarized as the United States and also Germany? And that may be yeah, our last question that we take. <laughs> so what, what is the answer to that? Hmm. <laughs> you want to start? We can ping pong, play ping pong. Yes, yes. Well, I think that we've, we've had a long discussion over the last decades between discourses, well, weighing discourses of recognition against discourses of redistribution. Um, and people, critics, scholars, um, Nancy Fraser, Axel Honneth, probably are the two uh, main speakers in uh, a dialogue about these two topics, have come down on various sides of that, um, yeah, of these sort of balancing scales, if we want to look at, at look at it in this way. So um, discourses of recognition, the sentimental certainly is a discourse of recognition. What it does to effectively we distribute or to make a society more just. This is still, there's still a question mark for me <laughs> behind that um, issue. And I think what we see um, polarization is a result of, I think, social injustices and, un, and uh, inequality on a large scale, structural inequality, systemic injustices. Um, and these um, di dynamics then, or these, um, asymmetries, they create a dynamic of their own that leads to polarization. And um, here I want to just briefly point to one example, one um, pair, of, uh, uh, pair of scholars that I uh, admire, uh, Pippa Norris and Ronald Inglehart, who have worked exactly on the way in which we use cultural differences, cultural divisions as a compensation to address social 
inequality. So rather than tackling uh, the distribution of wealth or the you know, fight of poverty or whatever you want to call it, uh, we are maybe engaging in sort of cultural conflicts, in, in, in co conflicts about very different things that have nothing to do with a problem that is underlying um, the culturalization of social injustice. I think that's a term that they use also. Uh, and I find this uh, partially, I find this very convincing. And so I guess polarization arises from inequality and injustice. Um, and I think that we have a long history of priding ourselves that the liberal democracy model <laughs> that is in place in the two countries that we are speaking about is um, not allowing that in such a crass way. And I think we are realizing that maybe that is not the case. Hmm. Over to you. <laughs> <laughs> um, interesting. Um, so thank you thank you that it is a nice um uh, opening for us to reflect about other countries and other situations um um and it's true i mean th there are very different uh, descriptions of it so uh, i am not an expert on china i cannot claim any expertise there here's an interesting and and i do this anecdotally so um i have, have many students from china um in my um, um, in my research groups or interact with them. Um, and it, recently we were talking about um, doing a study that would be a comparative studies of affects in different countries. And we were thinking about India, about China, Europe, and the United States of America to kind of get a couple of different groups. And so, so we were brainstorming and uh, the Chinese students in, in particular, then we're thinking, okay, what is a particular way how to describe the mood in, in, in China? Now they are students, so but they, what they came up with, this was interesting. There's not something that we would see maybe as strongly in the Western countries, was a concept that I had not heard about. They called it the king of evolution. Uh, my Chinese is not good, otherwise I would try to pronounce it, but I would probably just kind of offend people with, with that. Um, and it was king, not queen of, uh, I asked about it, but they say, no, they always say it's a king of evolution, which means that there is a lot of competition towards um, using your time very effectively, coming forward. For the students in particular, the image that they used to describe this was the students at the elite universities having had mounted their laptops on their bicycles so that while they were biking, they could read papers um, to effectively progress and come forward. So this is it. They said that is the effective divide in the country, not a divide in terms of polarization, but something that th that's a, a hot topic where they feel like you're either trying to be part of that evolution to make it to the top, the fittest survive, or you're watching this and you're not in despair when you watch it and you're not part of it or you can't live up to it. Um, you're a little bit of um, nostalgia. It's, I don't even know how to describe that emotion that they were describing then to say you're admiring it without feeling that you can do it or even want to do it. Um, so there's very different kind of public moods if, if this is correct. I mean, this was something that I felt there. They have very different interesting moods that uh, control things. Um, and they are not, it's all not always about polarization. In this case, it could be seen as a fear to left behind, but it can also be seeing, okay, we are, we are all in this kind of race together here. So can, competition can also be a public mood um, that leads to a very different situation. And we would describe very different aspects that, that have consequences for the feelings that people have, for the way how they have empathy or not have empathy, how they channel um, these things. So, so there is a rich discussion of it. And I, I just wanted to hint at that briefly here. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> Thank you for that. Yeah, I think our time is up. Um, Thank you for tuning in. Thank you for all of your questions, which have led us here and there and uh, to many places where we didn't even plan on going in our conversation. <laughs> um, yeah, thank you for your interest and uh, thank you for the Breithaupt. Uh, this has been um, a wonderful premiere with you here. <laughs> and I hope uh, everyone will tune back in for our next uh, event. And uh, for now I say, Good night, have a nice evening, have a nice afternoon, wherever you are. And uh, we'll see you soon at the BAA and the IU. Good night. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Heike. Thank you.